Good morning, and welcome to Discipling Nations. I'm Pastor Ryan Briggio, and today I want to show you four healing stories from the Bible, four healing stories of Jesus that show a progression of faith. You know, God wants our faith to progress, to grow from, from one stage to the next in trust and faith in Him. So today we're going to look at these four stories together and see what we can learn about Jesus and faith together. The first one is found in Mark chapter 6, beginning with verse 1. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked. What's this wisdom that has been given him that he even does miracles? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son? the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here among us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, Only in his hometown, among his relatives, and in his own house, is a prophet without honor. He could not do any miracles there, except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith, or amazed at their unbelief. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village. Jesus went to his hometown of Nazareth where he grew up. He would have had childhood friends there, family members there, cousins that he probably played in the river with and skipped rocks in the water with. He would have known, probably known everybody there. When the Sabbath came, Jesus began to teach in the temple and the people were amazed at his teaching. And they began to ask questions like, where did this man get these things? Meaning, where did he learn all these things and these amazing insights? He's from here. Where did he learn this stuff? What is this wisdom that has been given to him that he even does miracles? And then they said, isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and his brother James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't they here with us? And aren't his sisters here with us? Something happened in this story. At first they were amazed at him, but something happened between verse 2 and verse 3. They were amazed at him, and they says they were in awe of the miracles he performed on the sick and diseased. They, you would think they'd be proud of him. You would think they'd be, they, this is our hometown kid. Jesus is becoming famous. He's going throughout all of Jerusalem and all of Israel, and people are getting to, well, he's starting to become well known. They should be proud of this homegrown kid. But I believe after they heard his teaching, and after they saw his gifts and his talents, they became jealous of him. And they took offense at him and began to spread bitterness and offense around Nazareth. And, they did, and when they did, the miracles that Jesus was performing there, they stopped. Verse 3 says they took offense at him. Offense is the, means a stumbling block placed in the way in which another may trip and fall. And these people got offended and they stumbled over the stumbling stone. If you remember, Jesus said in Matthew 11, verse 6, Blessed is the man who does not fall away or stumble on account of me. Verse 4, Jesus said to them, Only in his hometown, among his relatives, in his own house, is a prophet without honor. In his hometown, among his relatives, Jesus had no honor, because a verse 5 says he could not do any miracles there, except lay his hands on a few sick people, heal them. Because of the lack of honor shown to Jesus and the bitterness and the offense, he could not do any miracles there. It doesn't say that he would not do them. It says he could not do them. Notice verse 2, which we looked at, says, The people of Nazareth were amazed at his teachings and by the miracles he performed. But verse 5 says he could not do any miracles there. So what happened? What, what changed? Which one is it? Are they amazed by the miracles he did? Or there were no miracles there? Well, I think it was both. They First they had miracles, uh, and then they did it because something changed. They became jealous of his giftings, of his talents, of his amazing teaching ability and miracles. They started treating him as a commoner, as a common person, not as a, someone special and holy, anointed by God. And uh, isn't this the carpenter? Isn't his brothers and sisters here among us? He's one of us. This guy's not special. They dishonored him. And uh, remember it says a prophet's dishonored in his own town. 
and they became bitter and offended and spread that bitterness all around town. And that's why the miracles ceased. Verse 6 says, Jesus was amazed at their unbelief. At the beginning of this story, they were amazed at Jesus because of what he said and what he did. But by the end of the story, Jesus was amazed at them and their unbelief. Their bitterness, their jealousy, their offense, their unbelief, their dishonor of Jesus caused the miracles to stop. He could not do any more miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. Jealousy, bitterness, offense, unbelief, and dishonor was a direct connection to the limited number of miracles that he performed in Nazareth. Their hardness of their heart limited Jesus or it limited God. You might be thinking, whoa, hold on, Pastor. How can we limit God? How can anyone limit God? Well, Psalm 78, 41 says, Yes, again and again they tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. Israel limited God by the rebellion and their hardness of their heart. Nazareth limited God by their bitterness, their offense, their unbelief, and their hardness of heart. And Jesus, or God, could not do any miracles there um, except heal a few sick people. But there were no miracles. Now, there's a difference between miracles and healing. And I want to just point that out to you. Even the Bible makes a differenti differentiates between miracles and healings. If you remember 1 Corinthians 12, 9, it mentions the gifts of healings. And then verse 10 mentions the working of miracles. So there's a separation there. There's a fine line between the two. But there is a difference. And I'm just going to give you my opinion between a miracle and a healing. To me, a healing... Uh, would be when a disease or a demon leaves a person's body and they return to normal, they return healthy. Whether it's gradual or instant, they become healthy because they were sick or they were diseased or they had some kind of de demon issue. A miracle to me would be more like what I like to call a creative miracle. For example, bones are healed that were broken. Arches are formed in someone's feet. They weren't sick. They didn't need a healing. They needed a miracle. Legs or arms grow out to their proper length. Backs are supernaturally adjusted and made well. Necks are restored from injury. People with metal in their body receive freedom from pain and increased flexibility. Are people getting out of wheelchairs? To me, those are miracles. And Nazareth didn't experience any that day, and probably going forward, because of their jealousy, their bitterness, their unbelief, offense, and dishonor. Jesus could not do any miracles in that environment. And I'm thinking if in our churches we have an environment of jealousy, of bitterness, of unbelief, of dishonor, and offense, we're not going to see very many miracles in that environment in our church or in our home as well. Miracles happen in the culture of honor, in the culture of faith. Now let's look at the next one. This one is If You Can. This is found in Mark chapter 9, beginning with verse 14. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. And as soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about? He asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought my son who's possessed by a spirit that robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground, it foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and he becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. O oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around and foamed at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, How long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for him who believes. Or, if you can believe, everything is possible. Immediately, this boy's father explained, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. This was a very serious issue. This boy was seriously tormented by a demon spirit from a very young age of a toddler. 
His spirit often had thrown the boy into the fire or into a pond or a raging river trying to kill him. The father said this happened often. Just think about it. This boy would have burn marks all over his body from falling into the fire often. He would need constant supervision from family or friends to protect from drowning or dying in a fire. Just imagine how exhausting that would be for the father and tormenting and painful it would be for the father and for the son. They needed help and they found the disciples. They, they had heard about the amazing miracles that they had done, the amazing miracles of Jesus. But the disciples each took turns praying for the boy and nothing happened. First one came, the next one came, next one came, and they all prayed and nothing happened. Now three of the disciples were with Jesus up the mountain of transfiguration. They did just return with Jesus, but they had nine disciples that had seen miracles and demons cast out. And they all took turns praying for this young boy and he wasn't healed. This father probably traveled a, a really long way, a very challenging journey to come and get prayer for his son that he be healed, but nothing happened. And I'm sure this dad felt deflated and discouraged and fearful that maybe my son's going to stay like this forever. Right then, Jesus came down from the mountain and a, a glimmer of hope returned to the father. But he didn't know if Jesus could heal his son or not. He didn't know how powerful Jesus was. He didn't know Jesus is the Messiah. He didn't know Jesus is actually God. He didn't know if Jesus would fail to heal his son the same way the disciples failed to heal his son. And the father said in verse 22, But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus said, If I can? What do you mean, if I can? Don't you know who I am? And Jesus said, If you can believe, everything is possible for those who believe. Jesus instantly flipped the responsibility of belief back onto the father and said, If you do believe, all things are possible for you if you believe. And the man cried out, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. This man did believe. He, he did have faith. He traveled a very challenging journey to get to that location to receive prayer from disciples and Jesus. He stayed after each one of the disciples prayed and failed to receive healing for the, the boy to receive healing. And he still stayed. He didn't, after Judas prayed, he didn't just, well, I'm done. I guess it's not God's will. And then the next one prayed and the next one prayed. And uh, he stayed. He let each one pray for him. He had faith. He did believe. But he also had unbelief. What he said was quite true. I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. I think this is where the majority of the church lives today. With this mixture of faith and unbelief. But Jesus said all things are possible to those who believe. Amen. The next one I want to look at with you is if he will. If you will. Found in Matthew 8, beginning in verse 1. And when he came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man and said, I am willing, be clean. Immediately he was cured of his leprosy. This man knew that Jesus could cure him. He just didn't know if he would or not. He was a leper, an outcast from society. His skin was rotting. His flesh was rotting and smelly. Could potentially have bugs and things in his skin. He probably hadn't been physically touched by a human being in many years. But Jesus reached out his hand and touched this man's leprous skin. And Jesus, that, that alone was probably healing to his soul, healing to his emotions. But Jesus did more than just heal his emotions. He healed his body too. Jesus was willing to touch the man. Uh, Jesus didn't become unclean when he touched the leper. The leper became clean. And Jesus was willing to heal the leper back then. He's willing to heal you today because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. This again, is, I believe, is where a lot of the church lives. They believe that God can heal, but they just don't know that if He will. How much faith do you think it actually takes to believe that God can do something? I mean, God can do anything, so it doesn't take, it takes a very small amount of faith to actually believe that God can. Where faith really comes into play is when we know and believe that He will. Faith is not the substance of things uh, I think He can, He might can. 
Faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The hope for there means a confidence, assurance of faith. You're, you're actually steadfast, you're convinced it is God's will. Faith is the substance of that confidence. And it's the evidence of things you can't see. So this man, uh, he knew that Jesus could heal him. He just didn't know if God will, if God would. Maybe you're there today. You're, you have this issue. You know that Jesus can. You know that God can. But you're not sure if he will. Well, let's look at the next one, the fourth one. This is found in Luke chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. When Jesus had finished saying all these things in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. There's a centurion servant whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. This is a very serious situation. This, this man is near death. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to, to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him. This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. For this, for this is why I do not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes or come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd, following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the man who had, sent, had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. He was healed and made well. This Gentile centurion amazed Jesus with his faith. He recognized the authority that Jesus had was similar to what he had. He was a centurion in the Roman uh, army. He, that means he had a hundred soldiers under his command. He could tell a soldier to go and he would go. He could tell a soldier to come and he would come. He could even send a letter of command and command someone to do something from a great distance and they would obey him. The centurion knew that if Jesus commanded the sickness to leave his servant even from a distance, it would obey Jesus at once the same way his soldiers obeyed him. This is faith. He took Jesus at his word. And Jesus told him, go, it will be done for you as you requested. And the, the servant was healed that moment. This centurion took Jesus at his word. He was not a Jew. He was a Gentile. He was not under the law. He took Jesus at his word and he received the desired results. His faith amazed Jesus. Wouldn't you want Jesus to say that about you and your faith? That it amazed him? It was amazing? Now in these stories, I see a progression of faith, these four stories. In the first story, Jesus could not do any miracles there because of offense and unbelief and jealousy and other things. In the second story, the man didn't know if Jesus could help his son or not. In the third story, the leprous man didn't know if Jesus was willing to help him. In the fourth story, the man had amazing faith and took Jesus at his word. First, Jesus could not. Then a man asked him, if you can. Then another man asked him, if you will. Then another man declared, just say the word. Hmm. Two of these stories say they, uh, uh, Jesus was amazed. In the first story, he was amazed at Nazareth's unbelief and their healing and their, uh, excuse me, and their offense. And that, that limited the healings that happened there, the miracles that happened there because of their hardness of their hearts. In the second story, Jesus was amazed at the faith of the centurion and his servant was healed instantly, even from a distance. One opened the door to healing and one closed it. Which are you today? Where do you live? Do you live in Nazareth, where offense and unbelief hinder your healing? Hinder what happens in your church or in your family? Bitterness, jealousy, unbelief, offense, dishonor? Do those, are those things in your life? Are those things in your church? 
If they are, those things are hindering you from seeing miracles, the miracles that Jesus wants to do in your hometown, in your, in your place where you have people there that you love and care for. Or do you live in a place where you, you do not even know if God can help you or not, or if He even does it? Maybe you believe the day of miracles is past and Jesus just doesn't do those things anymore. That He only healed people to prove that He was the Messiah. Well, that's clearly not true. Or maybe you know He can, but you don't know if He will. Or maybe you've taken Jesus at His word and you believed. The man that had amazing faith is the man that took Jesus at his word. And this is what Jesus is calling all of us to do. You know, it's impossible for God to lie. And when we don't believe what he said, we're dishonoring him. But when we do believe, all things are possible for those who believe. You know, sometimes we get our faith from what we've witnessed, what we've experienced in our life, and not from the word of God. Again, in the first story, they saw Jesus, he was doing miracles, he was preaching and teaching, and they became bitter and offended, and it cut off the flow of miracles. And then the next guy, he didn't know if Jesus could help his son or not. And maybe you're there, maybe you've you've gone to the doctor, maybe you've gone to receive prayer, and nothing's happened. And Maybe you've been prayed for by nine disciples or nine people. And nothing happens, so you believe, well, I guess it's God's will. I've received prayer. I went to the pastor. I went to this spiritual leader, and nothing happened. Maybe it's just God's will for this, for my son or my family member or myself to stay sick. And, that, and Jesus, Jesus shut down that lie right away. He said, what a perverse generation to think like that. Bring the boy to me. It is my will for that boy to be healed. It is my will to be, destroy the works of the devil. It is my word to set that boy free. And if you have that thought in your head, you need to cast down that vain imagination also. It is God's will for you to be healed. I don't care if you prayed for by nine people, ten people, or hundred people. It is still God's will for you to be healed. Seek God's face. Go after Him. Maybe you're more like the next guy. You know that He can, but you're just not sure if He's willing. Uh, And, you know, I think that's very common in the church. you, You hear people pray these prayers. God, heal me if it be your will. Well, we don't know the will of God by what we experience and see on the outside world. We know the will of God from His Word. And that's what the Roman centurion did well. He took Jesus at His Word. All he wanted Him to say was, go. All he wanted Him to say was, He's healed. All he wanted Him to say was, it's done. And his friends left and went back to Him, and his servant was healed that very second. He took Jesus at His Word. He just, I don't even need to see you. I'm not worthy of coming into my house. I'm not worthy of of even meeting you face to face. I'm a sinful man. I haven't done everything right. But if you have mercy on my servant and just say the word, I'm going to believe you at your word. I recognize your authority. I recognize that demon spirits obey you. I recognize that sickness and disease obeys you. Just take him. I'm going to take you at your word and believe my servant to be healed. And that man was healed instantly. The man's servant, centurion's servant, was healed instantly. It was a Jewish man, instantly. Guys, God wants you well. Whether you're at the the state of the man where I do believe, Lord, help me overcome my unbelief, or you're not sure if he's willing, like the leper. In all these stories, the gracious, loving kindness of Jesus, he still reached out and touched them. He still healed them. At each of their faith levels, he healed them. And they, they all were healed showing the will of God for you to be healed. But today, God wants your faith to progress. He wants to grow and go from glory to glory. And eventually come to a place where we're taking Jesus at His word. Mark eleven twenty four says, What things shall you desire when you pray? And believe you have received them, and you'll have them. So we're taking Jesus at His word. We believe we have received it. He said, go. He said, be healed. He said, be cleansed. He said, whatever. You take him at his word you found in the Bible and you hold on to that. You hold on to that confession of faith and you declare out of your mouth, by his stripes, I am healed. I am healed. Your body might not uh, come in line with that yet. You might not see that desired result instantly right then. It might take a little bit of time. But as you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, your body will shift. Your body will obey the command of Jesus when you take it by faith. Remember, Jesus said, all things are possible to those who believe. So He can. He will. 
Just take him at his word, amen. Amen. Today I want to just close with praying for some that are sick there in your home, on, t- on TV, friends and family members. I just want to bless you in Jesus' name. So Father, in Jesus' name, I take authority over all sickness and disease. I thank you that you want us well, and I thank you it is your will for us all to be healed. I take authority over demon spirits and uh, spirits of witchcraft. I break those curses off your family line in Jesus' name. Be healed in Jesus' name. Tormenting dreams. Yes, nightmares, dreams, torments. Be gone in Jesus' name. Generational curses be broken in Jesus' name. Sickness and disease leave your body. Bones be healed. Backs be healed. Miracles take place in Jesus' name. Bones, necks, knees, uh, ankles, joints, arthritis type pain. Be healed in Jesus' name. I pray for sicknesses to go. Cancers, and tumors, COVID, whatever you're sick with. Be healed in Jesus' name. Guys, I want you to take me at my word. Take Jesus at his word. Hold on to your faith. Hold on to the word of God and you will receive what you ask for in prayer. Maybe some of you today don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You don't know that he is the Messiah. You don't know he's the Son of God and that he is God. But after hearing these messages, maybe the Holy Spirit stirred your heart. And today you want to receive Christ to be your personal Lord and Savior. Well, if that's you today, I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Father God, I'm not worthy to be your son, but I ask you to forgive me of all my sins, to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I believe with my heart, that uh, Jesus, that you are Lord, and I believe with my heart that you have been raised from the dead. I confess with my mouth that, Jesus, you are Lord. Father, I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. Come into my heart. And cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Guys, if you've prayed that prayer, the Bible says all things have become new. The old is gone. You've been forgiven. All your sins, though they were red, though they were like scarlet, Jesus' blood has made it white as snow. You have been forgiven. You're a child of God. And I'm asking you to join a church. Find a good church where they're teaching you the Word of God. Get discipled. Read your Bible and pray and listen to the voice of God. And be changed from glory to glory as you spend time with the Lord. That change in your life will be a constant change in your family and people around you. Amen. It will absolutely change your life. My life was totally changed by the love and power of Jesus. And I know yours will as well. Guys, we're out of time for today. I love you. I bless you. I hope this message encourages you and just uh, builds you up in your most holy faith as you pray and believe God. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.